this building. Last year we were in Hazyview and Kapsuhup. Last weekend I was in Sabi, and next weekend we'll be in Kapsuhup again where we will be ordaining two new elders. It's a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to be able to share the Word of God. It also is a responsibility. And um, I thank you in advance for your patience, listening to us or to me. Um, For those who do not know me, we both, my wife Debbie and I, grew up in Pretoria. And 30 years ago, we responded to what we felt was God's call to go to the Netherlands. We've been there then for the last 30 years. We uh, planted a church from out our home in one town, and then after 15 years we moved to another town where they asked us if we would come and lead the team that was of a fairly new church there. And uh, I did that until two and a half years ago, and now we travel around mainly in Holland, and our work takes us primarily to churches that where people come from a very staunch, hyper-Calvinistic background, uh, where they become interested in more of what is in the Word of God, and they have a personal relationship with the Lord, and often cannot find it anymore, or cannot uh, feel at home anymore in their churches, and then go to churches similar in some ways to this. We are grateful for the privilege of working with those people um, and uh, trust that God will continue to use us in the way he has as we seek to be faithful to him. We have two children. Our son is 42, married with four children. Um, And uh, recently, my daughter-in-law's brother, emigrated to South Africa, Christian and Bianca in White River. Some of you may have met them. His sister is our daughter-in-law. And they have four children, and we have a daughter who has been living in Australia already for 20 years, is married, and they have three children. So a little bit about, that doesn't make it very important to the message, but then you have a little idea who we are. I always enjoy just knowing a little bit. He can he be trusted? So I trust with this. I've cleared that ground. I'd like to pray. Father, thank you for the privilege of sharing your word. I'm nobody special. No great accomplishments. No books written about me. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And thank you this morning for your grace. Thank you for having saved me. Thank you for all those whom you used to shape me and to help me to grow in my relationship with you. Thank you for the opportunity this morning of standing before these people and sharing your word. And I pray that as your word goes out, it will not return void or empty. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart may be acceptable in your sight. I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. The message I share with you this morning is very simple, basic. And if you've been a Christian for longer than a year or so, you will not hear anything new in general. There will be aspects that are new because we're always learning. And there will always be something that we said, I've heard it a hundred times, but now, ah, I understand it in the context of. And I'm going to, we're going to start in Genesis and we're going to end in Revelation. Don't worry, I'm not going to be hours. I know what time I should be finished. But in the beginning, we read of the creation, God having created ultimately man as the crown of his creation. And man sinned. Adam and Eve sinned. 
And after they had sinned, God punished them for their sin and cursed the devil. And at the same time, when God confronts Adam and Eve with what they had done, he announces his plan of redemption. And we read, the first text that we read together is Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. Genesis 3 verse 15, where God says now to the snake, it was the devil that came in the form of the snake, and he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his hill. And the seed of the woman that God is referring to here is Jesus. And Jesus will crush the head of the seed of the snake, while the snake will try to crush Jesus, will only bruise his heel, as it were. And here we have the first announcement of the gospel in which God says that he will provide a savior who will crush the serpent's head. And he will provide a savior because the, the relationship between God and the man he created has been broken. This is a clear reference to the Lord Jesus Christ and what he will accomplish when he victoriously conquered death or conquered sin and death and the Satan when he sacrificed his life, gave his life up as an offering on the cross of Calvary. But what does this exactly mean? Now, we look back in hindsight and many things have become clear to us because we've read the Bible, we know the end from the beginning, but can you imagine what Adam and Eve could have thought that this could mean? If I'd been Adam, I don't think I would have an inkling of what God was saying here. And I'd like to illustrate that by way of uh, something that happened in our personal lives. As I've said, we grew up in Pretoria. I was nine years old when my parents spoke about going for our first holiday to the sea. We had no idea of what the sea was. As you know, at that time, that was in 1964 when they started telling us, we had no television in this country. My parents had come from Holland. They had spent two weeks on a ship coming here from Holland. So they knew the sea and they started telling us things. But we could not imagine what it was like. And so came April 1965. I was just 10 when we left in our little car, three of us in the back, and the car packed, and we left for Hebedean on the south coast, south of Durban. And as we were driving, I remember, that I don't remember the whole journey, but I do remember when we saw some water saying, is that the sea? And my parents said, no, that's not the sea. And I also remember going over Van Rienen's Pass and then you could see a dam in the bottom there and we said, is that the sea? And they said, no, that's not the sea. And so we traveled a long journey, squashed in the back of the car. The roads weren't like they were, to, then weren't like they are now with no highway. And I imagined when I was busy with this that this is something what... Adam and Eve, but also all the people through the Bible felt. Where is this seed? Is that the seed of the woman? Is that the seed of the woman? After God had spoken these words to Adam and Eve and to the snake, these words of judgment, he immediately gives Adam and Eve hope. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 21 we read, And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. That means that an animal had to die. For us, the picture becomes a little clearer. There is death required of an innocent animal in order to, for the man to become acceptable to God. And God clothed the, the man and the woman 
with acceptable garments that he himself provided by way of an animal. And we go to Genesis chapter 2, and that in Genesis we read, among others, the story of Abraham. And Abraham and his wife have no children. And they're getting old. Adam, a, Abraham is 75 when God comes to him and says, you will have a son. It takes 25 years before that son comes. Abraham then is, is uh, 100 and his wife 90. And they receive their son Isaac. And then when the boy is growing up, God speaks to I, uh, Abram and says to Abram, I want you to offer sacrifice your son. That son that God had promised and the son that they loved so dearly. And they were to go to the place where God would show them on top of a mountain and there he would have to sacrifice his son. The amazing thing is, I'm not going to preach about Abram this morning. The amazing thing is that when he hears this from God, we don't read anything of him going into a discussion with God. How can that be that you ask me this? How can it be that you ask me to kill my own son? None of that. We read only that the next morning, Abraham gets up, takes his son and some servants, and they start the journey to the place where they are to fulfill what God has said. And along the way, Isaac said to his father in chapter uh, 22, he says to his father, here I am, my son. He calls to his father. And Isaac says to his father, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Where is the lamb? We as children in the back of the car every time said, where is the sea? Where is the sea? And now I want to translate that into the situation we're looking at. And they begin to ask, where is the lamb? Where is the lamb? And Abraham in verse 8 says, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. And there Abram built an altar, he put the wood on it, he then put his son, tied his son up, put his son on it. And when Abram picked up the knife to do what God had told him to do, through an angel, God calls to Abram and says, don't touch your boy. And then Abram looks up and there in, the, in, the, in a bush he sees a ram caught by its horns. Abram had said by faith, to his son Isaac, God will himself provide a lamb, and now God has provided that lamb. And then we could have said, well, is that the lamb? But we know, looking back, no, that wasn't the lamb. But what is significant here is that here is one lamb to take the place of one human, one man. And this was a foreshadowing of the lamb who would lay down his life as a sacrifice for many. We skip and we go to Exodus. Exodus is the story of where we, in, the first, in the beginning we, we, we meet the Israelites who have been in Egypt for hundreds of years and have been treated very badly as slaves. They've been crying out to God and eventually God answers them and he's going to lead them out of their slavery towards the promised land and he chooses a man. We often see in the Bible that whatever God does, he chooses a man and leaders come forth that he uses to lead his people on. And shortly before he is about to deliver them, he gives a Moses a number of instructions. He makes known to Moses a unique plan of salvation for his people. In verse 3 of chapter 12, Exodus chapter 12, verse 3, this is what God says to Moses. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house. A lamb for a household. It was to be a male animal, one year old, and it had no, must have no defect, nothing wrong with it. It then must be slaughtered by sunset on the 14th day of the month. They must take its blood and they must smear it on the doorposts. I'm telling 
this very easily. And we have read it many times if we've been a Christian for a longer time. But can you imagine what that must have felt like if you were there, you'd never seen something like this. I know that I would have said, this is strange. This bias knocks. I would have questioned, you must slaughter the animal. Imagine that you now, the father of the home, you've got to slaughter this animal that you've had in your home for a few days because they were to keep it. The children have already called it something because it's a lamb. It's cute. Lammy. Lummy. Volley. What, whatever they, and now he comes and he says, we're going to slaughter it. The kids cannot be locked in their rooms. They see what's happening. And then the father says, now imagine he's an Israelite, but he's got Egyptian neighbors. And the Egyptian neighbor says, hey, Yitzhak, what are you doing? Yeah, God said, the man that God chose to lead us, he said that we must take its blood and we must smear it on the door frame. Sometimes God asks us to do funny, strange things. Many people find what happened here this morning when people went and got baptized couldn't God have done it another way? Why must we do this silly thing? And then they are to roast the animal and they are to eat it, the whole family together. And that particular night, then God would pass through Egypt. The angel of death would pass through Egypt. And everywhere where the angel saw blood on the doorposts, he would pass over. That's where we get the word pass over from. He would pass by. He's alpha beichan. And the firstborn child will not be killed there. But everywhere where there was no blood on the doorpost, the angel of death struck the firstborn of man and beast. The, doorpost, the blood on the doorpost served as a sign of the faith in God of the Israelites and their obedience to God. So by doing that, they were saying, we trust God. We don't understand it. We find it very strange. It's so odd in this time that we're living in. But we trust God, and because he said it, we will do it. Like those people this morning. And like in our lives, so many other things we have done, simply because we trust God and want to obey him, but understanding it, no. Grasping it, no. Explaining it to people who are very skeptical of our Christian faith is difficult. And Paul, many, many, many centuries later, speaks about or refers to Jesus Christ as our Passover lamb. And when his blood is seen smeared on us, death will pass over. And then as we go on in the Old Testament, as we continue to ask where is the Lamb, we see in the rest of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, that there were many different types of sacrifices. Lamb, sacrificing lambs played a very important role in the Jewish spiritual life. Every morning and every evening, a lamb was sacrificed for the sins of the people. But this had to be repeated every day, taking place in the tabernacle, once the tabernacle was there, and later in the temple. But once a year, there was the Day of Atonement. I don't know what it is in Afrikaans. Grote Versoeningsdag. Something like that. On the annual day of atonement, the high priest had to perform a number of elaborate rituals to atone, atone, appease God as it were, to seek forgiveness for the sins of the people. And on that day of atonement, every year, the, the, the high priest took two goats. And one animal was sacrificed as a sin offering for the people of Israel. Its blood, it was slaughtered, and its blood was sprinkled inside the holy place of the tabernacle, the holy of holies, on the Ark of Covenant. And it was then said that that animal shed its blood to 
atone for, om versoening moendlik te maak, to atone for the sins of the people. But there was another animal. That animal was not sacrificed, was not slaughtered. That animal served as a living scapegoat. Sonderbok. And Aaron, the high priest at that time, but later others, Aaron had to take laid his hands on the head of that living goat, and then he would confess over it all the wickedness, rebellion, and the sins of the people of Israel. So he would lay his hands on and he would say, I confess on behalf of the people their sin, their disobedience, their rebellion against God. And by doing that, he transferred the sin of the people onto the animal. And then there was a man who was appointed who had to walk, lead that animal, that goat, into the desert. And so it carried away the sin of the people. If we go back to our question, we would have been present there and we would have said, is this then the lamb that was referred to in the beginning? But it wasn't yet. It wasn't yet. All these sacrifices, those of every day and also the ones every year on the Day of Atonement were just a foreshadow of Christ's perfect sacrifice and his atoning, atoning work on the cross. Now we skip a number of centuries and we come to Jeremiah, we come to Isaiah. And they also predict the coming of a lamb who would take away the sin of the people. And yes, Isaiah, he refers to a lamb that would be led like, a, like a, a man who would be led like a lamb to the slaughter. Isaiah gives us a little more insight into who the lamb is. So we are asking if we were living at that time all those years, we would say, where is that lamb? Where is that lamb? Now Isaiah comes and he says that lamb is a person. And he speaks about the suffering servant of the Lord. And the famous well-known chapter is chapter 53, where he says, and he came among us, but he was despised. He was rejected. Nobody wanted to look at him. And then he says in verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before it shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And so if we'd been living there, we would have said, okay, who then is that lamb? Because now we heard it was a person. Who then is that lamb? Where is the lamb? Who is the lamb would be our big question. And this prediction of the Old Testament prophets was, of course, we know about no one else, none other than Jesus Christ who is the Lamb of the God. And that he, as the perfect Lamb of God, will take upon himself the punishment that we have earned and he will die in our place so that we may go free, like the Israelites were able to go free out of Egypt. Where is the Lamb? Who is the Lamb? We traveled by car, it was Renault Dauphine loaded, roof carrier packed. We had trouble on the way, so we had to spend a night in, Ma in Peter Marisburg. And eventually we got in, all packed again, on our way, first time to the sea. At what point exactly it was, I don't know, but as you come from Peter Marisburg and you eventually come on top of a hill near Durban, in the distance, my parents didn't have to say, there is the sea. We knew it. From as far left we could look to as far right we could see, there was ocean. There was the sea. But we just still had to discover what the sea is. And after 700 years, about 700 years after yes, yes, Isaiah, I normally preach in Dutch, Yesiah. <laughs> after about 700 years, John the Baptist answers the question of where is the Lamb? Who is the Lamb? In John 1, 29, when John is baptizing people in the Jordan, he looks up and there he sees Jesus coming towards him. And he says in verse 29, Behold, 
Behold the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. There was a lamb or an animal that was killed so that Adam and Eve could be clothed. Then there was a lamb that died in the place of Isaac. And then there was a lamb that died in the place of a family, of a household. And then on the Day of Atonement, there was a lamb that was killed on behalf of the sins of a whole nation. One nation. And now John comes and he says, there's the lamb who will not only take away the sin of a man or a woman, not of a family, not only of a nation, but the sin of the world. In other words, John is saying, here is the lamb we've all been waiting for. Here is he who is that lamb. Here is the lamb whom God said through Abraham to Isaac, God himself will provide the lamb. And here is the lamb of God. He himself has provided this lamb. Here is the lamb who will take away the sin of the whole world. Under the old covenant, the lambs were only for Israel. Their death could not take away sin permanently. It had to be repeated. Every day, if you came personally, every year, for the nation. But under the new covenant, the Lamb of God sheds his blood to take or shed his blood to take away the power of sin. Not only for Israel, but for all who trust in Jesus Christ, for makes it possible for the whole world. John tells us in one of his letters, John chapter two, verse two, he is the propitiation. He is the atoning sacrifice. He is the versunen for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. And thanks to Jesus' substitutionary, that means he, did, he took our place. Thanks to Jesus doing that for us, on our behalf, in our stead, because of us, he has become this perfect sacrifice for sin. And his resurrection three days later, through that, we can now have eternal life if we believe in him. And then Peter lets us know when he says, we are not ransomed from our senseless way of life, senseless way of life with perishable things such as silver or gold, but we have been ransomed by the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He is the perfect lamb of God. There was no, is no defect in him. And that's why Jesus on the cross could say, it is finished. It is finished. The plan that God announced in Genesis 3 verse 15, and that man looked forward to and every time got a little bit of a better understanding of what it would mean. That plan has been accomplished. And here I am, the perfect Lamb of God, who gives my life for the sins of the world. It is finished. It is now possible for every human being to obtain freedom from the power of sin, from the power of death, and from the power of Satan. Without exception, Jesus' death, when he said it is finished, Without exception, every form of sin and evil has been covered over. There is no sin too bad. There is no wicked, wickedness too terrible. There is no habit too often repeated that cannot be taken away and forgiven by Christ, our heavenly Lamb. And Jesus is like, on the one hand, Jesus is the Lamb that died when the high priests sacrificed that lamb on the day of atonement. But Jesus is also the lamb who was sent away, who carried away the sin of the nation, now of the world. So the question was, where is the lamb? Who is the lamb? And John answered and he says, there he is. There is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
Now, after John the Baptist, we're moving towards Revelation. After John the Baptist, the emphasis in the word of God becomes, behold the Lamb of God. Look at the Lamb of God. Get to know the Lamb of God. Allow the Lamb of God to work in your life. He says, look to Jesus. He's the long-awaited Messiah. He is the Savior of the world. The New Testament says to us, believe in that Lamb of God. And whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting or eternal life. Who believes in him, whoever believes in him will no longer be condemned. And then Paul writes in Romans 8 verse 1, there is no condemnation. No, geen veroordeling, nie verdoemenis. For those who are in Christ Jesus. Whoever believes in him will not remain in darkness, but will live in the light of God's Son. The New Testament says, not only say, okay, yes, we heard, that is the Lamb of God. But the New Testament encourages us, Jesus himself says, accept him, the Lamb of God who takes away the world. Give him, he gives us power to become the children of God. John 1 verse 12. The New Testament encouraged us to get to know him. I saw when I turned in here the board on the entrance of, of the main road there it says, knowing Jesus and making him known. It's our delight to be able to get to know Jesus because of what he's done. And he says, get to know me. And then the New Testament says, follow him. Follow him. Devote yourself to him. Give yourself over to him. Submit to his lordship in your life. It's one thing for us to have sat on that mountain or as we traveled down and said, okay, there's the sea. Can you imagine if my parents said, now you've seen it, we're going to turn around and go back to Pretoria. Love him. Love him. Honor and worship him. These are all the things that John the Baptist could have said that day when he said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But we see that in unfolding in the New Testament. Enjoy him. Enjoy everything he has done for us. Enjoy everything he's given to us. And so we traveled down. It was still another two hours or so at that time in, in the car going to Hebedin. And we arrived there at a little cottage or whatever we stayed in. It. And uh, then we went to the beach. And my parents had bought us buckets and spades. And uh, uh, we started playing in the sand. Can you imagine if we had stood there as three kids? I'm the oldest. Ten-year-old and whatever the others are, eight and five. Can you imagine that we stood there like this and said, it's beautiful. Now our parents encouraged us, yes, the sea, now go and enjoy it. So we started playing in the sand. And then you go and stand on the water's edge and you feel the water and you feel that you, you're sinking in a little bit. And then you run back with a big wave and eventually under the guidance of your parents you go into the water this deep and that and then you... And you come up, <coughs> but you want to go back. You, you want to enjoy what you've looked forward to. It's, it's come. It's reality. And then we dig holes and we bury our dad in it and, and each other in it. And we did not remain standing on the side as an observer. No. We got ourselves into it. And that's what... Jesus calls us, come, all you are thirsty and drink, and there will be waters of living water flowing from your innermost being. Come and enjoy me. Come and get to know me. Come and live life with me. And after his death and resurrection, Jesus went back to heaven. And then he promised that he would send the Holy Spirit to help us to live this life of getting into the promises of God. And if you have trusted and given your life to Jesus Christ, there will come a day when you will join many, 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 many others in confessing, worthy 
Worthy is the Lamb of God. There is a time coming when all those who have been cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and saved by his sacrificial death will live and be in his presence forever. The presence of the Lamb of God. Everyone whose name is written in the book of the Lamb will one day kneel before him and he will be the Lamb in the midst of the throne. And he as Lamb will be the lamp of the new city. And together with an innumerable multitude, we will worship the Lamb on his throne, saying, Romans 5 verse 12, with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And we won't be told to worship. We won't be, come on, come on. We will be so grateful, so delighted, so that we've, the, that's the moment that we've longed for to eternally enjoy. And then in Revelation 19, John describes hearing another voice. And it sounded like the voices of a large group of people as loud as thunder or the roaring sea. And that voice said in verse 6 of chapter 19, Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. And then verse 7, Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. And an angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. And then I hear you say, I haven't had an invitation yet to that marriage lamb, a marriage of the Lamb. And we, the church of Jesus Christ, those who have been redeemed, those who have been washed by the blood of the Lamb, those who have the blood of Jesus as a sign on them, they are part of the bride of Christ. But you say, I haven't received an invitation. Well, perhaps you've never yet received an invitation until this morning because I have explained the invitation to you this morning. Invitation is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you are invited. That inv the gospel is the invitation to every man and woman, every boy and every girl. White, black, Chinese, Dutch, even people from Pretoria. To be a part of the bride of the Lamb of God, the bridegroom. In the meantime, we are still here. And we are on the journey. We're not asking where is the Lamb, where is the Lamb. Our only question is when is the Lamb coming again? But in the meantime, we have a responsibility and we can enjoy playing on the beach and getting ourselves in the water and we have the responsibility of helping others to come. And in the words of Psalm 34 verse 8, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. That must be our motto as we go. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And explain simply as I have this morning the process of how the gospel of Jesus Christ works out its course in history. And I close with a question. Do you know him? Do you know the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? And in the words of a famous hymn, are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? If yes, your answer is yes, rejoice with me. And allow what I've shared with you this morning to motivate you anew to live for the Lamb, to live with the Lamb, to honor the Lamb, obey the Lamb, and make Him known to others. But if your answer is no to my question, do you know that Lamb? Then I invite you this morning to make a decision to ask somebody to explain to you, maybe pray with you, that you allow that lamb this morning to become your savior. And so I don't know how you do it in church here, but 
afterwards, I'm sure there will be an opportunity for anybody that wants to talk to come to the front and you will be helped by someone, I'm sure. I go back to those who say, yes, I know that lamb. My question is, are you following him? Are you walking with him? Are you living for him and his glory? For him who gave his life so that you and I may be saved. And the angel of death will eventually pass over our lives. Are you rejoicing in him? And do you find your fulfillment and your joy in him? In spite of all the difficulties of life, is he your and my fulfillment? And does knowing him and serving him and following him give us a joy that cannot be explained, but gives glory to the Lord of lords and the King of kings?